I am ready. This meeting is being recorded. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Christina. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm so excited for today. Ah, me too. So I just got off a call with my child's therapist, so I'm a little bit emotional. Uh, so if no, I start no. crying today... Uh, it's, it's okay. It's I'm okay. I totally understand. <laughs> yeah. How old are your kids? I have three beautiful boys. They are seven, 11, and 12, soon to be 13. Okay. Okay. How, how about great. you? Um, I have two kids. My daughter's 17, so she's embarking on her last year of university. And I have a son. He's 12, and he's just entering middle school. So I have one that's finishing and one that's just starting. <laughs> oh, God bless you. Oh my gosh. You don't look yeah. like you can have a 17 year old. <laughs> oh, wow. Thanks. <laughs> that's a compliment. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank so we so both much. have 12 year old boys. We do. We do. It's a shame we live so far away. <laughs> I, <laughs> we <gotten> together. <laughs> I know. And where are you again? I'm in Greece. I'm in Eastern Europe. And how about you? I'm in Massachusetts in the United States. Wow, quite quite far away, quite far away. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for doing for wanting to speak to me today about childhood trauma. Oh, it's my pleasure. I I actually um I like talking about that subject. I'm informed with that subject and I think it's a subject that's uh, going to be relatable to a lot of um women out there and a lot of single moms. Um, so let's let's jump in. Let's talk yeah. about childhood trauma. For sure. And, and like you said, I'm, I'm also very well informed with this subject because mm -hmm. I endured trauma in childhood <laughs> and um, my children have endured uh, trauma and mm -hmm. which is why I've uh, finally got them into therapy and uh, you know, and, and, and it hasn't been easy. So, you know, I, what has your experience with, with trauma been? Um, my experience with trauma growing up, it took me, I've also been in therapy for years, right? So um, that was something that was um, pushed by my mom at some point um, when I think I was 17, 16 years old. And, you know, we had some stuff going on in, in um, our house, mainly due to my dad. Um, and she's like, you need to go to therapy. Um, so my first experience was when I was about 16. And honestly, after all these years, it was the one thing that actually saved me and taught me um, what really went on in my childhood, how that really affected me and how it's affected um, my adult life and my relationships. Um, I focus on relationships as a coach, but it really affects everything. Um, just a little bit of a background. I grew up with a father that was a very angry man, uh, kind of like, have you heard the term? I hear this term thrown around, a rageaholic. Have you heard of yeah. that before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. like the Incredible yeah. Hulk. Exactly. Incredible Hulk, uh, very unstable, very unpredictable. From one, you know, uh, day he could be like, you know, I wouldn't say he was a good father, but he was kind of like, okay, normal coming home from work, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, the next moment he would just explode out of thin air. So I mainly grew up in a very angry household. Um, and I remember one of my experiences was that when we would sit down, um, so I'm just going to close that, my dog, um, <laughs> we, we couldn't sit down as a family without arguing at the table. It was just mm -hmm. um, screaming, screaming, screaming all the time. Um, and my trauma does go a little bit deeper into other areas um, like physical abuse, um, verbal abuse, emotional abuse. Um, by your and my dad. mom, sorry, by your dad, by my dad. Yes. Mainly by my dad. Yeah. Um, and my mom, you know, she did the best she could, but she was very focused on my dad. So it was kind of like walking on eggshells, you know, 
like, oh, be careful, um, you can't say this to him because you're going to set him off or you can't say that. So I grew up, you know, living on eggshells around a man, a father that was very volatile um, and very emotionally unavailable, mm -hmm. physically unavailable and emotionally unavailable. So, um, and my mom was, like I said, very focused on my dad. So I've also been through a 12 step program, CODA, um, which teaches you about codependency and relationships, right? So my mom was very codependent. Mm. Um, and one of the messages that she, she didn't directly, you know, you get these messages from parents. Some of them are nonverbal, but it's just this energy or this vibe or this message that they give off that, you know, what I was taught or how I interpreted it as a child was that the man is the most important and, mm -hmm. you know, you need to do everything to keep your man happy. happy. And yeah. kind of like be this woman that's kind of like in this service mode. You're, you're mm -hmm. there. This sounds really awful and really misogynistic. You're there to almost like service him. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and which meant that my needs were not important. Um, and that's how I felt as a child. Um, I'm also a middle child. So, mm -hmm. you know, I have an older sister and a younger sister. And I was kind of like that really quiet child mm -hmm. that was the invisible one that, you know, you could just throw me in a corner and forget me for five hours. Mm -hmm. That was me. So I felt very, very alone and mm -hmm. very um, just misunderstood mm -hmm. and kind of that awkward child kind of very and then it, it kind of manifested in my teens um kind of socially awkward very very shy very withdrawn um you know I was a late bloomer uh very very afraid and shy around uh, boys um what else can I share um well, that's crazy because like I was a youngest child and I have my own you know uh, I was a scapegoat, but my middle boy, because like I mentioned, they've been through their own childhood trauma and my middle boy is very much like that. And I'm happy yeah. that they're getting therapy now. Um, it took me about two years to finally get him therapy because there was like this huge wait list, but yeah. Um, yeah, he's very, he's not socially awkward, but he's, but he's very quiet and the way he talks, um, it's different than other kids. And I never thought of it. You know, I knew I, I just I, I never thought of it because he was a middle boy or because of I always thought it was kind of like a a confidence thing. Like he needs, you know, I thought it was because of his dad not being around or all the stuff that we've been through. Um, uh -huh. I, you know, it's funny to hear you say that, that that was kind of like your experience as well. Uh -huh. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I think it's great that, you know, the children are getting therapy for such a lot from, from such a young age. It makes them aware of certain um, situations. And it also gives you the power of choice. Therapy gives you the power of choice because you're aware that that's not. It's kind of like we've been programmed living in our family of origin and we're programmed um, to actually make certain choices. In, in yeah. every area yeah. and affected um it affected my self-esteem a lot and my self-worth and that kind of spanned out to even my work it took me after the I'm, I'm 48 I, I started my coaching business when I was 35 so it took me years to figure out yeah. what I really liked and what right. I really wanted to do it just affected everything the self-esteem right I think that for me was the most but were you um, were you doing therapy since you were 17? Like, has that been a consistent thing? It has been a consistent thing. It has been a consistent thing. And I was lucky enough to found a therapist, which was very close to her. I've been with her for over 20 years. And she actually helped me through my divorce as well. Um, and, you know, at some point she's like, oh, you don't need any more therapy. She said, just take action, you know. Uh, she was she's been with me since every um, stage of my life since you know 18 years old 
Um, so I don't actually do therapy anymore, but um, I've, I've done a few, you know, self-help programs and some coaching programs. And I always like to keep myself informed. Um, it's kind of you like think a, you're, Do you think you're codependent on your therapist? Could be. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Does it sound like it? <laughs> yeah, I, I, she was almost like a, um, what I was going to say, but I bit my tongue like a, a mother figure to me because yeah. my mom was kind of uh, like emotional and available as well. Uh, um, but yeah, yeah, I just, um, it, it was time to let that relationship go, but she did help me a lot. How about you? Uh, I just started therapy. It's funny because I've been, <laughs> it was my normal, my entire life, my childhood, uh, all of the abuse, um, how I was treated. Uh, I knew it wasn't the way other families were. And I would see other families and want to, my family to be like other families. But I just figured that was just how my family was. And I dealt with it for many years. And then I got into bad relationships. And I figured um, that's just that was myself. Like that was just my normal. Like I I didn't realize that there was a connection about mm-hmm. with uh, how I was raised uh, and the choices that I was making in the in the relationships that I was forming. And I mean, every relationship, even friendships, you know, um, and right. then I met my children's father. And again, uh, that relationship, I jumped in uh, in an attempt to escape my home life. And um, but he, I did. Yeah. I also did that. Sorry to interrupt you. It's yeah. Okay. I left home and I just got married. Oh, yeah. Wow. And it was more of like, I, it was, it, he was the lesser of two evils. I had seen a lot of red flags, but he, he seemed like a nice person. So um, when I married him, it was just, I, I instantly started to <laughs> realize that I made a mistake because he had a lot of qualities that showed that he wasn't apt to be a husband and much less uh, like a, a man in our lives, you know, but I went forth with it because um, again, I, I was very religious and I had, a, uh, I had already gone through a, a previous relationship prior to, to that marriage and that failed. And that was like very violent. And that was very traumatic for me too. So part of me, which I just, did, I refused to go through it again. So I conditioned myself to just survive it and to become better. I just conditioned myself in that relationship that it was that I was the problem and that I just needed to be better. I needed to be a better human, a better woman, a better wife, a better daughter. Um, I was just not good enough in any way. And so, and everything that I did to be better for so many years, um, you know, I, I pursued careers. I just like, I, I was a perfectionist in every way. Um, but you know, the relationship never got better. It just got worse and worse throughout the years until, Uh um, the day that I realized it wasn't going to work. And, you, you know, and I prayed for so many years for God to make things better. And even though I knew in my, in my heart that the answer was (laughs) that things would be better, outside of the relationship, I still had a hard time. I had convinced myself through the religious views that I needed to stay and try every route possible. And I did. And then when I figured that I had tried every route possible and it was still not working and I looked at my children and they were starting to obtain traits of the abusive behavior, which at the time, again, I didn't know it was abusive. I just thought it was just bad behavior or it was just my normal. That's just, it was the the normal behavior, but I didn't like that normal. And I wanted to change the normal for my children. So I knew that their dad wasn't treating me with respect and with dignity. And, and it wasn't so much of the way he was treating me. It was what he was teaching them to treat me. And so Mm. I was, I refused to allow my children, three boys, which were going to be three men to grow up, to have those behavior traits, not as long as I was their mom and I was responsible for their lives and their future. So I made the decision to leave and it was a process. It wasn't easy. 
Um, and after leaving, it was, it was abusive still. It got worse and worse, but I still did not realize it was abuse. I did not realize it was abuse until I started to see that my children were not themselves. Like they were emotionally and psychologically and being all types of abuse from their father. And it was more blatant and more direct. And so I was like, and it, they were being used as leverage to, to torture me, to abuse me and to mistreat me and manipulate me into doing things. And um, then one day I came across like an article about covert passive aggressive narcissists. And when I read the article, I, uh, I saw my entire life written on there. I said, this is, this is everything that I've gone through in all of these years and this past over a decade in this relationship. Mm -hmm. And for the first time I felt validated and I knew that I wasn't crazy because I had thought for all those years that I was just making stuff up in my head. I thought I was just crazy. Mm -hmm. And, um, I felt validated and I cried and I bawled. And that is when I started to understand and process that what I was going through was not normal. It was my normal, but it was not normal behavior and that it was actually abusive behavior. But even after that, it still took me time. It still took me time to process it and to understand it. And I didn't start getting therapy until about two years after like really uh, and so, so that first moment when I say, wait, this is not normal. This is passive aggressive narcissism, covert passive aggressive narcissism. Um, and it's still two years later when I had uh, certain incidents happening with my dad and my family. It was just, I was like, I, I've had enough. I was doing so much for so long, carrying so much weight, doing so much running around, trying to be the best that I could be at everything and never being good enough for everyone. And I was like breaking down. And when I looked at my life, I played, I played a scene. It was like a, a, a movie scene that went from my childhood all the way to that moment in my life. And I looked and said, looking for a healthy relationship. And I realized that all of, all of my experience from childhood had been toxic relationships. I had mm. not had a healthy relationship in my entire life. I didn't know what that looked like. I didn't know what that was, what that felt like, because all of my life since childhood, this had been my normal. And when I realized that at 35 years old, almost 36, or I had just turned 36, when I realized that, I fell apart. I fell apart. It was like the dam broke in me and I couldn't put it back together. And I, I, I was, I literally got into the most depressed state of my entire life and I couldn't function as well at home. And that's when I realized I needed to get help. And so that's when I started to get therapy and in therapy, I got diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder with anxiety oh, wow. and depression. And that was a process for me because I was 36 years old and in my entire life, all I ever wanted to do and to be was good. I wanted to be a good girl, a good daughter, a good uh, wife, a good mother, um, you know, a good student. I wanted to be a good Christian, but I was never good enough. So in all of my life, when I realized uh, and I took and I had the, the, um, the PTSD diagnosis, I had a whole wave of emotions come through me. It was anger <laughs> that my entire life I had been going through all of this uh, BS and led me to, to get PTSD <laughs> to get that bad. So I was angry. I was kind of like in disbelief and in shock that I could have PTSD. I mean, I, I'm in the army for God's sakes. Like usually you hear this from war veterans and I got PTSD uh -huh. from civilian life. <laughs> well, that, that shows the extent of uh, the impact of uh, the toxicity and the abuse. Yes. That had on you. Um, and I'm familiar with PTSD. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, victims of sexual abuse, physical abuse get PTSD. I think I even have, I've never been officially diagnosed, but I 
definitely feel that I had a trauma response at some moment in my life. I would just, in certain instances, because my father just instilled fear, you know, mm. that he would scream in my face, right? Um, and I used to have relationships like that with men, and I would just freeze. I was just going, you know how fight, flight, freeze when we're yeah. in uh, yeah. adrenaline, adrenaline, I would just freeze. Yes. And that freezing yeah. would just make me shut down completely. I couldn't talk. I couldn't, yes. I couldn't move. Yes. Um, and uh, th- that's, that's a, a trauma yeah. response. Yes. Trauma. Yeah. What my therapist taught me was, got a, and I used to disassociate a lot. Mm. Um disassociate like you're not in the present moment you're kind of somewhere you kind of go away you kind of like you kind of zone out and it's right. like and, and I would have that like when I would relive and I would retell a story and all of a sudden I was there I'm telling the story as if I'm living it like I'm literally there right. in the moment right. in my mind and I was constantly retelling these stories again and again and again and reliving them with all the feeling and the emotion that went with them Yes. And that's one of the things that, you know, led to my diagnosis as well. And, and, but when, but again, when I had diagnosed after getting over the anger and getting over the, uh, all of the shock and everything, I had a wave of now I understand, like I, now I understood myself better because I had a lot of those triggers, like you said, and I didn't understand why. I just thought exactly. that it was wrong with me. And I was trying to fix that. Like I've been trying to do professional or personal development for years and I couldn't meditate. I couldn't, I had all this anxiety. I had a hard time, um, you know, thinking positive thoughts and uh-huh. getting rid of all of these negative thoughts in my mind, all these reliving these negative cycles. I had a hard time um, just like, I, I just had a hard time. Like I had a hard time with a, a, a just reading, focusing on reading. And I'm an avid reader since I was a child and yeah. I couldn't focus on reading. I would reread the same thing like 20 times and it was hard to concentrate. So things that I oh, used I- to be able to do really well before I couldn't do them anymore. And so, so I was like, oh, I get it. So I started to learn more about PTSD what caused it, you know, how the brain is physically different. And then I started to validate my experience and I started to say, okay, there's a reason why I have these physiological responses. So I don't have to judge myself anymore for feeling or thinking this way. And when I started to go through that understanding of my diagnosis, I started to heal better. Because I wasn't judging my process anymore. Mm. Does that make sense? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I was just thinking of um, what triggers the beginning of healing. Because healing, uh, for me, healing has been a journey. It's a journey of self-development, like you said. So um, I think the, the, the healing is triggered when you have that aha moment, when you read that about covert, because my ex-husband is a covert narcissist. Um, the, the shaming, the guilt, the, yes. I can't do anything right. Yes. The criticism, um, the gaslighting, I feel like yes. gaslighting is the narcissist's favorite. So they make you feel like you're crazy. Yes, um, like, yeah, I, he would tell, my, my ex would tell me that I was crazy. He would tell me and say, yeah. he, would, he would call me sick in the head, like, you're just making right. stuff up. You're crazy. You're sick in the head. And I yeah, literally that's... thought that I was making stuff up. Right. Right. For a long time, it's I would like... say, am I making it up? Because he seems like such a good, he seems like he's such a nice guy. Because one moment he was this way, but then the next moment he was really nice. So I would be confused. I'm like, who's the, wait a second. Like, am... so maybe I am the bad guy because I got angry or I got upset or I said something wrong and that's why he acted that way or did he act that way and then I got upset or did I get upset? Like, I, it would just be this crazy cycle. So it, for a long time, I literally thought that I was crazy and that I was making stuff up and I had to, I, that's why I was reliving a lot of this experience again and again in my mind because I had to tell myself that I wasn't crazy, that I actually lived it and I had to validate, that was my way of validating my experience by reliving this stuff 
and telling myself this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. But am I crazy? No, because this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. That's kind of the cycle that I was in. Like, am I, I making? I'm, no. Yeah, I, I'm very familiar <laughs> with that. Yeah, I absolutely understand. It's that, who, who's the crazy one? It's like, you know, it's like a very simple example. is like the, the, the wall is white and he, they're telling you, no, no, it's black. But you yes. can see that the wall is white. Yes. But they're like, no, you're crazy. You're blind. You can't see the wall is black or whatever. Um, so they're making you crazy. And then what happens is um, you start to doubt yourself, yes. right? But um, my, and, and this goes back to childhood abuse. My, my father was a narcissist. Mm. So when I started to come kind of begin, you know, the healing and, you know, start to learn a little bit more of, oh yeah, that's what happened to me. Um, that's how I used to be made to feel when I was young. Yeah. So it all ties down, right? That's um, right. That's right. And that's when, when I had that realization that since my childhood, all I've had are these toxic relationships because my mother, she was not, she was not covert. She was very, very overt. Like she was very kind of like your dad. Like she'd be okay one moment. And then the next moment she'd just flip out and she'd like stay, she'd say very hurtful things out of nowhere. It was very constant though like you you know we'd have we'd be having a good conversation and then out of the blue she'll say something extremely hurtful or she'll do something extremely hurtful or back when I was younger she used to beat me out of nowhere like um she would get upset at my brother and my sister because she had relationship issues with them and mm -hmm. I just be I just happen to be around <laughs> and then let, let's say that like I I touched uh I put my cup on the table and she, you know she'd flip out and you know beat me for it and then I wouldn't understand why what happened, what happened? That, was my what childhood. that was my childhood as well so it's so funny how we then got ourselves into relationships. It's like we're, we were reliving this like childhood experience. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Um, well, I've, I've done some, a lot of reading. And so um, what happens is, is that um, we try, and it's, this is kind of like a subconscious. That's why when you start becoming aware, kind of like the consciousness um, or the awakening, right? Um, so you're not just walking around life like a zombie without knowing why you're choosing this and where it's coming from. It's kind of like we're programmed to reenact what we had in our childhood. So if our parents' relationship was toxic or abusive, we want to duplicate that because yeah. that's been, there, there are role models Basically, I can put it in very simple terms. There are role, are role models. So um, I think that's what people think is the right thing. That's been their example, yeah. right? And when yeah. you've been programmed and spoken to a certain way and treated a certain way, and you look at your parents and I don't know, they're fighting or they're loving or, you know, whatever the, the difference may be, um, that's what you're going to look for because you don't know anything else. And a lot of people just... Um, and like myself, I just chose a map. I remember because I had a lot of shouting mm. um, and aggressiveness, I chose a man that was the complete opposite. Never, ever, I've, I've actually never seen a person that does, has never raised their voice. Mm. I mean, I even shout at my, 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 my kids sometimes and I feel yeah. so bad. Yeah. Uh, but my husband, my ex-husband never raised his voice. However, if he wanted to make you feel this small, mm -hmm. it was just his tone, his, yeah. the way he would look at you, yeah. and it yeah. would just feel so hurtful without ever raising his voice. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, yeah. Or, or the, or the lack of interaction, the, the ignoring, in my case, it was like, he would just ignore my existence. He would just pretend I wasn't even there. Well, or he That's would also do form of abuse, yeah. you know, the shutting out, the shutting out. Yeah, yeah. he would shut me out. He would do that to the kids too. Like he would just ignore. 
And I could be talking to him and he would just look away and he'd be, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm like, but look at me when I talk. He was like, I'm listening. I'm listening. And I'm like, is he really, th- is this the way he interacts? Because let me observe. So then I'm observing how he interacts with other people. And I see that with other people, he interacts with them normally. He looks at them in the eye. He has engaging conversations. And I'm like, no, he's only like that with me. So this is like that for years. But I think another reason why we repeat this in our adult life is because every human being is born with a need to be nurtured and loved. And in childhood, when that is not um, fulfilled, it's like an empty cup. It's like an empty cup that never gets filled. So when you grow up, you are looking for your mom and your father's love and affection that you never got in childhood. Yes. And then you end up in a relationship with somebody that in one way or the other, you attract who you are and what you, what you know, like you said, subconsciously. You don't make a, a conscious choice. I'm going to marry like my, my mom. Or I'm going to marry somebody like my dad because they abuse me. I don't want that. But you subconsciously do it, do attract them in order to wow. fill that void because narcissists tend to love bomb. Yes. So in the beginning of the relationship, wow. they give you all the world. They fill that void that you feel was so empty, that cup that has never been filled since your childhood. And this narcissist comes in and fills it. But then once the cup is full and overflowing because you've been love bombed and then a narcissist shows his true face and starts abusing you. Now there's a trauma bond because but this is your normal now, because when you were a child, you're, you know, at least in in my case, I remember that all I wanted was my mother, my father's nurturing and approval So, so that when they mistreated me, I quickly forgot what they did to me. I quickly would forgive them because all I wanted was their love and affection. So uh-huh. this is what happens in a relationship. When you form a relationship with a with a person now that resembles or, or it's repeating that uh, childhood abuse. And now, you know, he's not filling your cup, but he filled your cup once. So you know that the potential is still there. He gave you that love once, but it's empty now. And he's not, he's just mistreating you. But you let it go because you want him to fill that cup like he once did. And so that's the trauma bond. And you kind of live in that illusion of once he was able to give me this. So this one time he was nice to me or he said one these kind words to me or he did this one nice thing to me. And so you focus on that that need that you still have. And so you oversee that he's also treating you like shit. He's treating you like garbage. He's putting you down. And, because and you that's your normal. It. Yeah, you 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 excuse. You're like ah. Uh, you justify. Like, yeah, exactly. yeah, he's nice, but he's, he has this one time that he's really sweet. Yeah, and you kind of just do it like to give you a little bit to, to hook you in a little bit more. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then yeah. once they have you hooked in, then it's like the same again. Yeah. Um, yeah. and it's very like my experience of the trauma bond. It's very like highs and lows almost yeah. like an addictive thing like yeah. there's highs yeah. where he's like giving me a little bit of attention it might be and it might be um crumbs that's what yeah. it felt like I time I thought it was, wow but yeah. now it's like I was being breadcrumbed and I thought yeah. it was like the most special thing yeah you know? yeah and it really wasn't <laughs> And it's really what it is. All it is is your childhood need to be fulfilled, that that childhood desire to get that nurturing from your parents that you didn't get, that you still have. So the way out is to nurture that in a healthy way, not looking for it in other relationships because you're going to keep on getting into unhealthy relationships. So it's going deep inside. And this is what therapy is so helpful because you can go deep inside and talk about the pain and the anguish of that childhood trauma and find ways to nurture that and to and to heal that that mm-hmm. inner child um, so that now that you have this your whole again you won't need it to be nurtured by somebody if you if somebody treats you like garbage you'll be like that's it red flag you don't deserve me there were, there's no way that a person 
you would accept that. Yeah, you would. A woman with self-esteem and feeling whole and worthy within herself would ever accept being treated like that. And I was accepting awful. I was like a doormat. I had no um, identity. And I remember I used to go from relationship to relationship. um, And I used to mold myself. I don't know if you did this into him. Like yeah. he liked soccer. Yes. I like soccer. Yes. Like okay. kind of wanting to please them. Right. Have you seen the movie uh, Runaway Bride with Julia yes. Roberts? Yes. 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 And she's molding herself into each. She's like, oh, I like those kind of eggs. But yeah. no, with yeah. this boyfriend, I like that kind of egg. Yes. He likes that mountain climbing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I was like, wait a second. What do I like? Yeah, and I, I I never knew what a healthy relationship felt like. I yeah. didn't know how to be yeah. in one, which also brings me back to um, I needed to heal myself before I could be in a relationship. Yes, and this is a good segue for our next talk about relationship, yeah. right? And I think that right. um, you know we could you know th- there's like so much that it's affected like you said earlier a lot of our decisions every decision that we make in our lives financial decisions relationship uh-huh. decisions your interaction in your workplace some people deal with a lot of bullshit at work because you know again like they have an, an inability to create boundaries and all of that stems from childhood trauma so I'm just so excited that we met today and we spoke about this and that we're going to be meeting again to talk more Me about these topics. Very exciting. I'm also very excited to talk about other areas that childhood trauma affects and absolutely affects everything. So I'm excited. Yeah. So for for those of you guys that are watching um, this series, this is Single Moms Talk. And today's topic is childhood trauma. And my name is Rebecca Elizabeth. I'm a single mom of three beautiful boys, a trauma survivor and a life coach. And I'm Christina. I'm also a single mom um, of two beautiful children, divorced, and I am a relationship coach and I work with, uh, single moms as well. And I kind of help them navigate their healing process. So they, the goal is to be in healthier, more fulfilling relationships. And that's a good way to start of, um, creating that healthy relationship and that loving relationship with ourselves first. Right. So we can share that with someone else. That's, that's my wish. Yeah, can, you know, for myself and for other women, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And I help single moms that have overcome uh, abusive relationships or that have left to- toxic relationships and want to improve their finances and become financially independent or financially strong because uh, childhood trauma and trauma in relationships do affect your ability to manage your finances. So that's what I help mamas do. And I'm really excited that we are holding this series or doing this collaboration. Christina, I can't wait for our next talk. Thank you so much Me for this too. opportunity. And I can't wait to talk about how it affects finances because honestly, Rebecca, I have struggled with that. I relate to struggling with that. So, yeah. I mean, we all did. I was able to overcome it because I literally that I honed down and focused on it. So I can't wait for us to talk about what I did to become Uh financially successful after all the stuff that I endured and what I learned about myself in the experience. So I I guess that's a topic for next time. (laughs) Bye bye. Bye. Oh, wait, hold on. Let's invite, right. our, let's invite our viewers to watch our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're going to put the links down below. And also mm-hmm. join us, um, our Facebook groups. I am the uh, owner of the Financially Savvy Single Mamas group. And uh, Christina, your group? My group is Her Heart Repair. And we'll be posting it underneath this video um, on Facebook and within our Facebook group. So who would ever like to join? please join us. We will be uh, doing a lot of other uh, lives like this uh, and on YouTube. Excellent. So until next time, bye y'all. Bye-bye. Take care. Take care. Take care.